agronomist or a soil microbiologist. I actually trained as a political scientist. And uh, that's been sort of an interesting policy. I finished at Berkeley in 1970, so you can see how long ago that is. I went to Cornell, thought it'd be a sort of a temporary job, and I'm still there after 47 years. Uh, my first 20 years I spent in the College of Arts and Sciences in the Department of Political Science. It's called the government of a little more modest. I spent 20 years in Arts and Sciences, but I was chairman of the Rural Development Committee, which is an interdisciplinary group for the whole campus, including ag school, arts, regional planning, nutrition, and so forth. I really enjoyed getting all these different groups together. Did a lot of work on small farm agriculture. And then in 1990, when I was a very generous, private, anonymous gift uh, to work on sustainable agriculture and rural development. So we set up the Cornell Institute for Food Agriculture and Development. Long story. I ended up as director and I moved from arts to College of Agricultural Life Sciences for the next 15 years as director of CFAB. And while I was director of CFAB, we were invited to come to Madagascar to look at a USAID project which was intended to help save the rainforest, giving farmers living around these large national parks some alternatives to their slash and burn coloration of rice. And uh, it was long as People were hungry to say, I'm in Madagascar, there's land available in the forest, the farmers will find some way to take advantage of it. Uh, there's no way you could protect that huge 90,000 acre like, rainforest unless farmers had some good productive alternatives. And so I made my field visit to see whether we get involved in this. Uh, I went to the first morning in missing three villages. These are the first I've ever seen in all my. 40 plus years of working on development, I said to my colleague, well, we've got to get these rice yields up. As long as getting only two tons per hectare, which is about half of the world average, the terrible soils, very traditional methods, there's no way we're going to be able to keep that rainforest intact. And everyone agreed. When I got back to Madagascar, I said to the project manager, Malagasy, we have done is to be in agriculture. I thought we really had to focus on getting rice seals up. And he agreed. Uh, Malagasy feed about 140 kg of rice per person per year. And that much of rice gets you know, a lot of volume, as you can imagine. They eat it three times a day. And so it really it is culturally central to their lot ways of life. It's you know, a big challenge. North Carolina State had done a thesis on these soils around Ryan Mahana Forest. It's either some of the worst soils I've ever seen. 3.8 to 5 is the pH. Iron toxicity, aluminum toxicity. The cation exchange capacity is low to very low at all horizons. So they've done 20, you know, five foot core drillings and analyzer, 10 centimeters. Only one of them is at all decent. And the available phosphorus is less than two to four parts per billion. This is in Madagascar? In Madagascar. So this is less than half the minimum, I mean, 10 is usually kind of a minimum. You like 30, 40, 50, this is 3 to 4. This is possible soils. So it looks like a good situation. I got back, I met this small NGO set up by a French Jesuit priest, I'll show you the picture a little bit, who spent 30 or 40 years of his life trying to help farmers raise their production with available resources, not to be input dependent. Uh, he started off with chemical fertilizer, but, uh, switch when farmers can no longer afford it. Uh, and so the NGO said to me, as I explained the problem, got to get yields from two tons up to three or four. And this president of the NGO said to me, in a non-boasting way, he said, not a problem, no problem. We can get three to five tons, 10 tons, even 15 tons per hectare without changing varieties, without fertilizer, just compost, and less water. You should all say, that sounds really crazy, just as I thought. That's, that's it. Do they know I'm a social scientist and they can scam me? I can't do that. The Green Revolution had you know, new varieties, fertilizer, and water, and they got results. These guys said, oh, 10, 15 tons instead of 2 tons. But since, first of all, I had AID money that I could use instead of my own, and you know, it's like, it's probably wrong, but if it's right, it's really important. So we ought to at least. Try it out. No agronomist with credentials 
would ever even want to give credence to this. I can tell you that Cornell, I was, I mean, he gave a booty, but I expect that probably wasn't. You can't do that. Just like some things that Elaine England was showing us that they're doing in Australia, you can't do that. I have a wonderful little sign in my office someone gave me. It's an old Chinese proverb saying, those who say something cannot be done should stop interrupting those who are doing it. I, <laughs> I guess uh, you're the like statement. Uh, so anyway, I did. I had a reputation to lose, and it so happened the first year with some of the young trainees at the NGO gave us 38 farmers tried these methods, averaged eight tons. And some were 10, one was 12. Second year, 68 farmers, still eight ton average. 12, one was 14. And uh, third year. Up to still eight times from one to six times. What's going on here? So I figured, you know, that's a lot of science. It's got nothing to offer like this. The world's poor and hungry. So I started learning agronomy as best I could, and the French like to read these papers. And so that dragged me into this. So now I'm not really interested in politics. I'm terribly interested in politics, but political science is not very edifying. <laughs> and so now I uh, work on agriculture, agroecology, soil ecology, soil biology. And uh, we have a sort of a new line of discovery or validation, which is that when you use these methods, you also get rice grains that have higher iron, zinc, copper, and manganese. We had three different studies in India which from top scientists which confirmed it. So I'm gonna, that's what when I was first invited to come join this, I thought, I'd be interested to see how you can change your manners in order to be able to get more nutritious food, as well as getting more food. But you know, folks, oh, but I realized when I started putting this together, this is such a great story that if I just talk on the nutritional side, you'd probably be a little uh, disappointed. So let me talk about uh, the, I started in this nine abstract. There are continuing deficits in food supply, but quality is increasing concern both in the richer countries, but also should be for the poorer countries, because that's where they have the worst malnutrition. Uh, research institutions are pushing to improve the nutritional quality by plant breeding strategies. And what we've been discovering is that by changing your management, you can get probably even better results. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be reporting on today. This is developed, as I said, in Madagascar by a French desert called Henri de Lalanier. Grew up on a farm in southern France, born in 1920. Went to egg school, and then decided he wanted to do something more for humankind, so he decided to go to seminary. As soon as he got to be age 21, went to a Jesuit seminary. In 1961, was sent to Madagascar as a Jesuit advisor, you know, uh, assistant whatever. And he started working with farmers very inductively. And in fact, one of his lines in one of the only public papers is the rice plant is my teacher, mon maître, my master. I learned from the plant. What is it like? What does it respond to? Uh, now I say he'd been trained in the best French agricultural college in France before he, he was in an but you know, he still was not a specialist. And certainly not done rice. He had to learn it all very inductively. By 1983, he was saying he had assembled these practices called the system of rice intensification, SRI. He and his friends set up an NGO in 1990. Uh, we started working with the NGO in 1994, and it took me three years to accept this, as I said, because this is really pretty improbable, and I needed three years of results to have some confidence. Since I was a Cornell director, I didn't want to put Cornell's name on anything which was suspect or some kind of a hoax. Uh, but by 1997, you know, we had three years of results, and uh, so anyway, that's you know, now that I say that we have demonstrated the validity of these methods in 58 countries, and this shows you how it's fed, but it's fed without much enthusiasm from the institutions or universities. For us, it gives us the opportunity to work. I'm grateful for that, but it has not really given us much, uh, much support. And the good news is these methods to get a better phenotype for existing genotypes should work with all kinds of varieties. Our best yields have been with hybrids or hybrids. Varieties, but traditional varieties, which normally get one, two, three times, we get five, six, eight, ten, as high as thirteen times, too. So this is, I don't see a variety neutral. Some are better than others. 
but it's not variety dependent. And this really be just a, a broad on me. Uh, it's a set of ideas and insights, we say. It's not a technology. In the old model of VR, this technology is the new wine. It doesn't really belong there. Its use is a matter of degree rather than kind. She feels it is that SRI, is it not? I say, to what extent is it using SRI principles and ideas? Uh, it's based on knowledge, not inputs. You don't have to buy anything new. Use whatever story you have, whatever ideas you've got. That's a new knowledge, I should say. You know, that's knowledge, but it's not dependent on computer inputs. It's not proprietary. We provide this information free to anyone on the world with the website. In. Uh, and fortunately, we find people from country after country after country who take an interest. The Philippines is an electrical engineer, and Cuba is an nutritionist. In Cambodia, it's an agronomist. We give all kinds of people. Uh, but it's an open access technology innovation. It's hard for people to value it because it's not just one thing. It's not like a new variety or a chemical here or a machine there. It's a whole complex of management ideas. But I will say that if, once you understand the ideas, it's not that hard to grasp or to uh, <coughs> utilize. And then at least my preface. Also, I like to use it as a noun instead of an adjective instead of a noun. Not a thing, but a set of insights and understandings. It's really hard to make that transition. And I, I talk about SRI myself as a thing. But if you know, try to remember, I'm pretty meaning to talk about it as, as an approach, set of ideas. What is it? It's a change in the way we manage the plants, the soil, the water, and the nutrients, with the objective of having a change in the soil life. First thing we do is start with very wide spacing, using single seedlings in a square pattern, not in rows even. Preferably start with 25 by 25 centimeters, 10, 10 inches, but the highest yield I've seen is actually the 50 centimeter space. Huge plant, 70 tillers per plant, 400 grains per hectare, 21 tons per hectare. Uh, I don't talk about it very much because it just freaks most people out, but I've been in the field, I've counted the tillers, Stephanie's saying, I've counted the grains, they weigh the stuff. So a wide spacing, reduce the plant powers by 80 to 90 percent, and get two, three, four times for you. That's really bizarre. You can your own judgment. I'm trying to sell this. I'll tell you what I know, and you can make your own minds up. One of the secrets is to use really young seedlings. We want to call the fourth Philippine group. Kelly, I talked about Philippines this morning at breakfast. I'm going to, if you have to run less than 15 days, preferably 10 days, 9 days, 8 days. The younger is better, although below 5 doesn't get you very much. But young seedlings, widely spaced, and then mostly aerobic soil conditions. No flooding of rice paddies. This farmers do all around the world because it makes them feel comfortable, it suppresses weeds, but it makes the soil anaerobic. And that means you get a whole different population. You look at mycorrhizal fungi when you start flood your fields. You get only anaerobic bacteria, not aerobes. And as Lane was explaining again, you really want to get the aerobes up, both fungal and bacterial. Uh, we do active soil aeration. This is not required, but it really helps. We can add one, two, three tons per hectare just by using this mechanical push weeder both this way and that way. That's one of the father these innovations. So as you weed in both what we're doing is breaking up the crust of the soil around the plants, which means the roots grow better, deeper, more prolifically, and also the microbes are very different. And then we enhance the soil organic matter as much as possible. I don't think you can overdose organic <laughs> matter. You get too much of the bugs to scrunch it up. <coughs> so I think I started initially with irrigated rice, but it's been adapted by farmers to, first of all, well, direct seeding and upland conditions. I mean, so it's the idea of the technology we're talking about. And you don't have to transplant if you get a germination rates with your with your <coughs> The two things which explain what it's all about is that these markets I've listed here, they do that give you really large, healthy, deep root systems, which will degenerate under flooded conditions for hypoxia, and you get more abundant biodiversity <coughs> and active soil organisms. So these two things are the basic elements that I'm talking about. 
According to FAO, high smart agriculture requires you to increase production, adapt to the stress of climate change, mitigate global warming by reducing greenhouse gases. We do all of those. And so this is really smart. We also get rid of a million upturn more kilograms of milled rice per bag or bushel of uh, paddy rice because less unfilled grains and less chaff, less breaking during the milling. So we get about a 10, 15, 20 percent bonus of edible rice on top of whatever our patty yields are. We were shorter growing season by 5, 10, 15 days because the whole growth cycle accelerated and it goes through all the phenological stages faster. That means you have less risk of loss at the end of the season you know, from weather and these problems. This is especially good for women. We can talk about that. Because if you don't work in, first of all, women do most of the transplanting and weeding. If they're doing that in heavy, high water, like in the Philippines, they get more vaginal infections, more urinary <laughs> tract infections. A lot of the NGO workers have said it works. That's how it work. We've reduced the infections for women, which they never tell men about, of course. Also, if you have push weaver, you know, stupid all the time, women who spend their life working in price patties get skeletal deformities, disabilities. It's really hard work. Whereas you use this weaver, it takes a while to get used to it. But being upright and turning up the soil gives you more yield, and you don't have the same uh, disabilities. It can often can be labor saving uh, if you start with most. Of the labor time. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about when I finish is all this come back to the higher micro content in grains. Uh, production, we say we usually get 20 to 50 percent at least, off on 100, or sometimes 200 to 300 percent increase. It's incredible when you get these different phenotypes of rice, and I'll show you the features in a minute, which are using the available soil resources. Available water, available nutrients more productively. So you get more output with less input. It's counterintuitive, but uh, it's real. We make better use of available resources. And we have some super yields that we could talk about. Because it freaks a lot of my scientific colleagues out, I don't say much. Some of you may want me to go into it, I will. But average yields are what's important. That's what feeds the world. <laughs> That's what makes farmers richer, is the averages. You know, some of the yields, super yields, are just spectacular. This is to give you some overview. Uh, in 2013, we got data from colleagues in China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Cambodia, which are five countries where the governments have been supporting SRI. And we can tally up country by country at least three and a half million farmers who are using these methods, about nine and a half million hectares. Now, that's only about 2% of the land, so it's not a lot, but actually it's been a lot to have come this far. Yes. Uh, the average yield was 6.2. You think that increase times the area, uh, that's 5.75 million tons of rice produced with less resources. At a farm gate price at $150 a ton, that's really low. That would be at least you know, 8 or 2 million, add that saving the cost of production, about a billion dollars right there. And then you think of a farm gate price of $300, which is probably a better estimate. Philippines is like 350 right now. Yeah. That'd be two billion dollars in farmer income from the higher production and the lower costs. And this is of course environment friendly, so you get those other benefits as well. These are pictures set, one from Indonesia, one from Liberia, to show you the difference in phenotype. For the same variety you can get by having wide spacing or organic matter in the soils, starting with younger seedlings. Um, Miyati on the left there, it's one of our best stories. I can tell you about her if you like. I don't know as much about Edward Sohn on the Baptist in the Grand Gede County of Liberia. And these farms, these fields are all next to each other. <coughs> same climate, same varieties, but she the phenotype is different. And just magnificently different. This is a plan that was given to my wife and me by Indonesian farmers doing SRI methods. Uh, 223 tillers from one seed. And look at the root differences. And that's a root system that really gets you somewhere. <laughs> if you keep your rice flooded and crowded, you got this small root system and it starts decaying from about three weeks out. 
pull it up, it's going to be black and dark. You have to kind of help it color here. And to accommodate, it's remarkable once an organic farmer gave me a panicle of rice with 930 grains on it. Now, 100 to 200 is okay. 300 is very good. 400 you love. Five, six, seven. I've often, I don't even imagine 900 grains on one head, one panicle of rice. But I've held it in my hands. I counted 300 and that's about a third of the way through, so I took the furnace. <coughs> oh, this is hard to count these grains, but the point is that the potential that's in the existing genomes is much greater than we have seen because our methods of cultivation have often constrained it and big because we think that more fertilizer is going to get you more yield because you're providing more inputs, you know, nutrients. In fact, an organically managed <coughs> soil. It's true, we've done factorial trials where if you're doing one, two, or three of the practices plus fertilizer, that beats those practices plus compost. We do all of the recommended SR practices and compost, that beats all those practices plus fertilizer. Yes, please. Um, with the changing climate, does any of this make sense to uh, the locations in the U.S. that the price could be I think it will, and I'll talk about it. If, if, if these ideas are starting to be talked about. Jim back there has done a little experimentation in Pennsylvania. I think these ideas are very relevant to the U.S. Mark Fulford, who I thought I was going to see here, some of you will know him, has been doing this adapting for the crops. He actually tried wheat up in, up in Maine, and Moose King hit it. it was such a great crop. <laughs> but he could see the growth difference of this. Yes, back there. Is, is there a, enough similarity between the wild rice of North America and this and rice? That probably would be, but the thing is that wild rice and if wild rice and rice are a different species. But since we use these ideas on wheat, <coughs> finger melons, hurricane, even teff, Ethiopia, I think it probably would be pretty relevant. But anyway, let's, let's come back to that. These ideas are, as I say, are not limited to rice. Yes? Um, when you get an increase in yield of 50% mm -hmm. compared to an increase in yield of say five times as much mm -hmm. and and the practices are the same what is the variable is it compaction and inability of the roots to go down very deep is what is well percentage of is where you start you know if you're already up at 10 tons you're not going to get five times that obviously mm -hmm. but if you're in the two two to three ton range you know, you've got a lot of scope eight is roughly where rice will under lots of conditions and good management come out but really good management will get you 10 12 or 15 you know, to 20. And I compare that with saying that you know these methods are like the kitty hawk thing where you get you know, hairier than you know, uh, you know you could take and fly your airplane. You can get from the two to eight with sort of you know propellers. If you get the biology in it's like getting jet plane and you go 15, 16, 20 ton yield. So there, there's a certain amount of gain you can get just by the spacing timing in those practices and soil management, and then when you get the biology kicking in, it's like a real acceleration. Yes? But, um, a real high percentage of the silicone research is mm -hmm. done on rice mm -hmm. to boost uh, stock strength and mm -hmm. also disease resistance. Yeah. And it's also affecting the insect damage. Actually, I'll come back to silicon, but there's an interesting substory that silicon is really under attended to plant nutrient. Well, these are nutrient because it's so abundant in principle. But in fact, it's not all taken up and not all is utilized. We, we have larger uses, I'll show you, which is in large part due to the higher silicon content and size of the, of the tillers, but also <coughs> the root systems that support the plant. This is, was one of my first favorite pictures from Cuba. And this farmer who I visited four times in the uh, this is the first time we tried SRI. And the woman who helps promote SRI has visited Totale and then visited her camera. This plant on the right, he taken out of the same nursery as the one on the left, but it was only nine days old. Put it with wide spacing, so organic matter, so aeration. And at 52 days, since seeding, when you normally transplant, you took the one on the left out of his things to transplant in his regular field. And we happened to be there and had her camera, so she compared these two pictures. 43 tillers on one, five on the other, Q 
huge difference in size and color of roots. And uh, so when I saw that picture, it just, there's got to be something going on more than just in the plant itself. You know, the plants, you know, use of its available nutrients can't explain that kind of a proliferation. I sent her a, a, a video camera. So then the next year she took, this is on the web, I can get you the, she took, she wanted to visit me every week and interview and took pictures. So you can go online and see this farmer's uh, the next year. So you can see in real time. I mean, pictures like this can be photoshopped, right? So no one believes still pictures much anymore. Mm -hmm. So we sent her a camera said, take the video and you did a whole season. So you can see this kind of differentiation in the root and, and, and the canopy growth. Uh, it, it's just that that's one of our iconic pictures that explains right there. What you're doing is getting good root growth, which is stimulated by the interactions with the soil biota and by symbiotic endophytes, so I'll come back to that if you like. And with the spacing and the aeration, <coughs> you get a whole different expression of the plant's genetic potential. These plants have the same potential, but by changing the growing environment, here you get a different expression of potential. These are pictures. Uh, yes. So when you say 43 tillers worth yeah. versus five tillers, is that the number of times, or is that a special tilling? Machine. Oh, the, the, these were the, these number of tillers had grown at the same <coughs> at different rates of growth in the same period. So, so this you know, these are sister plants, same variety, VN two A four. It's a Vietnamese variety they like there. Okay. And but you took that one out when it was nine days old, transplanted a single seating, wide spacing, did all these management methods, and then. At 52 days, when he's going to transplant the one on the left, he went to his field and pulled out them and compared them. So you can see the difference from the same genetic potential. So with the wider spacing, more got more nutrients. Yeah. Soil, soil, organic matter makes a okay. difference. These pictures were sent to me from researchers in Iran and Iraq to show us as themselves the difference in the phenotype. And I emphasize this: look at the root differences. In the case of the Iranian samples, the color is just dramatic. Because the bicolor means they're necrosic, they're dying from lack of oxygen. Uh, and so, in this picture also, this is sent from Iraq, from the Rice Research Institute near Najaf, where they're testing different varieties for the response. Uh, they couldn't control the water that well. So, this is, in some sense, not even a full comparison because you have them side by side. But you can see now. Was more vigorous and healthy and effective. Uh, the plants on the left hand set, uh, uh, the left hand sets of uh, plants are on the right, which are conventional. Yes? The difference in root color is not because of the wide spacing, it's, it's mainly because of the difference in uh, irrigation practice. Irrigation, right, yeah. But the wide spacing gives you the growth because roots that are close together will inhibit each other. Yeah. We can talk about co root competition, right? <coughs> root cooperation. The plants are actually cooperating. Their growth algorithm is such kind of a live and let live approach where they inhibit their own rate of growth in order to accommodate each other. But if you put three, four, or five plants together in the same clump, none of those root systems grow very big. They also maybe survive if they're lucky. But if they have room to grow, they will expand and expand and expand. But you're right, the, the, the coloration, the necrosis, is a function of hypoxia on uh, the space. But again, that's why this is a system. It's a whole set of practices together give you a better root growth and canopy growth. Is this why plant spacing causes more root pressure? It does, especially if you don't flood. But that's why we talk about this soil aerating weeder, which you know we, we push it up and down the rows after 10 days, transplanting 20, 30, that's usually enough. If you do a fourth, you get even more yield. The more times you can aerate the soil around the plant, the higher the yield. But, you know, this is like a real hoe. We call a rot well, the French call it ro rotative, rotating hoe. It's got, actually, you have six, seven different designs. And depends on the type of soil. Heavy clay soils like a different one than lighter, bony soils. But the point is that weeding is not just weeding, it's soil aeration. And that's why the weeding is a cost. If you do this weeding, it's a benefit as well as a cost, so the net benefit is much greater than if you're just trying to keep the weeds down. 
we find that the active soil aeration makes a big difference. This is data from the China, the China Erie, the China National Rice Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Tao took the same variety of rice and then measured the weight of the organs for the some Samuel plants at initial heading, heading, full heading, milky rice, waxy rice, yellow rice stages, and looked at the stem, the sheet, the leaf, and the, the senescing uh, yellow matter. And they could see a huge difference in the panicle, excess the purple, and one stage later start of the senescence. So the plants you know, start dying <laughs> later during the year cycle. And you see the, the differences of uh, the sheath and the tear, you know, more sheath. But we got more of all these organs, and especially the panicle, than benefits <coughs> in the later stages. <coughs> so it's not just pictures I can show you. This is also good data from the top rice researchers in China. It's really hard to show much for the soil biota, but here's a table from an article I did showing uh, total bacteria, total nitrogen fixing bacteria, specifically azospiridum, azotobacteria, uh, phosphorylizing microbes, and then dehydrogenase, the enzyme <coughs> for uh, nitrogen fixation, and microbial biomass at three different institutions the Tamanara Agriculture University, Hickersat, the International. Crop Research Center and Summer Air Topics, Topics, and then the EPA Bay, which is the leading Indonesian university. These numbers vary tremendously from place to place, time to time. But the pattern is that you get some very substantial increases uh, in these different microbes when the plants are more widely spaced with the root growth, when there's more exudation from the roots, when there's more organic matter to feed the organisms, and then there's still a life in the soil. So we know we get more life in the soil this way. This is the research data which first spoke to me, uh, done as part of a, a baccalaureate thesis project in Madagascar, uh, where Andre Andre and Kaya uh, had done, like, in this test, they had a total of 240 two and a half meter by two and a half meter trials. They had a random block design on farmer's fields. One farmer had loamy soil, one had more clay soil, very complex, uh, but did the same methods. And if you just look at the rows and then the final column, the trials, at least these were six replications, so these are not just single plots. The farmer's methods, timing, spacing, flooding, with no soil amendments, gave 1.8 ton yield, a little less than the national average. If you use the SI methods without any soil amendments, you got 6.1 ton yield. So triple <coughs> there. If you added NPK, we went up to nine times. Fertilizer works, right? You get a 50% you know, increase by an NPK. You can use compost with these other methods, but up to 10.5 times. A further, you know, one-sixth uh, <coughs> increase in yield. Uh, on loamy soil, it's a little different. Um, because it's got all kinds of different microbiological dynamics. 2.1 to 6.6. But look at that first column. This is the counts of colony forming units of aces by rhythm in the roots. These are endophytes. And you have 65,000 in the farmer plots, no amendments. If you went to SI methods, big root systems, exudation, and all that, went to 1.1 million. If you added NPK, you got higher yield, but you had a 60% reduction in your aces by rhythm, which is an indicator of the uh, soil population generally. And then you put compost, you have to 1.4 million. So the, the management practices and in their interaction with this, the, the soil amendments gives you very different levels. And in the loam soil, one of the reasons the yields work so much with SRI by themselves, there's no soil amendments, you have 75,000, but for compost in that soil, it just shot up to 2 million. So I want. I don't know if even replicated this experiment. It's done it again. I want people to do that. But we have no resources to support research. So we have to depend on students here, students there, or faculty, and we do this. But this, I think, gives us insight into what we're seeing in the field, to see what's going on in the soils themselves. This is research, not SRI, but we're working with Dr. Yanni uh, in Egypt. Uh, he was doing work in the Nile Delta. But they had eerie close researchers. But look at the fact that what happens to the roots when you knock at the plant with 
reservoirs of bacteria. And so the, the, the dark colored bars are the inoculated plants, all of the white bars are uninoculated. Looking at the rootlets per plant, looking at the cumulative length, root length growth in millimeters, the surface area in, in square centimeters, and the root by bio volume in, in cubic centimeters. You see that the inoculation of the plant increases the root growth in all these four dimensions. Again, the numbers will change depending upon the variety, the, the inoculant, soil conditions. So, what he was showing, and it was published in the Good Journal of Australia, uh, is that you affect the morphology of the roots by having these microorganisms present in the roots. And so, again, a lot more work should be done on this, but this to me also helps to say, aha, that's how we got that picture from Cuba. That you know, it's the microorganisms and their mobilization, their proliferation, which will affect how the, the plants will grow. This is also for me was very important. <coughs> this is Chinese research, where this fellow from Qi for his thesis had taken soil, homogenized it, sterilized it, so he had you know just soil, right? It's not all that good. But he put them in six sets of pots. One he kept uninoculated to be the control and took five different strains of rhizobacteria to inoculate the plants in the other five sets of, of, of pots. And then looked at these variables here, uh, you know, total root volume, shoot pot, dry volume, shoot dry weight uh, per pot, the rate of photosynthesis, the water utilization efficiency, that's millimoles of, of carbohydrate fixed per micromole of water. So it's plant efficiency and then yield. You see that the control here, you know, significant increases across the board in these different morphological and, and physiological characters of the rice plant as a result of inoculating the plant with the microbes. And he also showed that in fact those microbes in the soil enter the roots through root cracks and go up through the leaves, into the uh, stems, into the leaves. So the plant becomes inhabited by these microorganisms when you're Inoculated soil. Yes? It's been any testing done to, to show that uh, organic growing of rice has lowered the oxalates in the rice? I don't know of any that's been done. Pardon? I, mean, I don't know of any, that, any research that's been done that it could well be. Um, I should say that SRI is not doctrinally organic, it is pragmatically <laughs> organic. And so we haven't made organic, non organic, a, a defining variable. But I'd like to see that work done because I think that it might. Not, not even necessarily the organic, it's just growing by that's right and nothing. Yeah, I can't think of any research we have on that. That's a good question. To pursue it. This, 10 years later, Feng Chi, five years later, Feng Chi published this article in the Journal of Proteomics where he was looking at the upregulation and downregulation of genes in plants that have been not inoculated or inoculated and found this kind of profile of, in the roots. Excuse me. Roots, leaf sheath, and leaf, you know, these are the up or down regulated genes that we can now identify with proteomic analysis so that the inoculation or the presence of bacteria in the plant will affect gene expression. And usually it turns out to be favorable improvements uh, than this. And I'm working with his mentor uh, now on some further work they're doing to look at the pattern over time of how rice plant's gene expression is affected by inoculation of rice bacteria or not. So this is getting really very interesting. Uh, this is some current work with a Malaysian colleague who's looking at the inoculation of rice plants of trichoderma and then using SRI methods. And he's, we have one published article showing there's a synergy between trichoderma inoculation and SRI management practices. And he's been looking at the gene expression with transcriptomic analysis and he gave this presentation last uh, March in Barcelona, Spain. But what it does is start putting some pieces together where you uh, with SR types of wide spacing young plants, compost, weeding, you're getting you know your nutrient mobilization, especially oxidation here, and they can identify uh, and also adding trichoderma uh, uh, osbellum and you're getting a gene for root elongation upregulated. A gene for phosphorus uptake upregulated. 
a tumor regulated gene upregulated, a gibberellin regulated gene upregulated from phyto hormones, from visco related genes, two of them that he's been able to identify in these testing, and also a coronary emergence gene. And he's doing some more work, which we'll have another three or four months before he get the results in, trying to trace how the change in the management and the microbiological you know, cooperation <laughs> is affecting specific genes uh, which are beneficial for the plant's performance. So this sense, this science tells us how we get to that human plant, which is so much more uh, prolific. So anyway, part of our explanation with the success of SRS in the water productivity of the plants. Uh, we are larger, less than SA root systems, Soil is better structured to absorb and retain <coughs> water to enhance crop performance of water stress. Uh, we did a meta-analysis of uh, published research studies done, done by us, but by researchers in eight countries, uh, 29 published studies between 2006 and 2013. Uh, the average water use, rainfall and irrigation water together, the standard management was 13 million liters per hectare of rice. SRI cut that by 3 million liters per hectare with a higher yield. And this was across the board. Uh, usually we see more than 11% yield. These are on station trials. But seriously, I'll just put it aside. Probably four or five times when we have research on SR done on station. It gives lower results than the farmers are getting these methods in their fields. Which is upsetting to the researchers because you know they're not replicating the farmer results. It's usually the other way around. And no one has studied this yet. One student didn't even made his thesis on this, but I think because of all the decades of inorganic fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, mollusticides, and you know, nematicides on the on-station trials, when you use these methods, you don't get the same response. Now, I'd love to have some study that properly, but that's our observation. So that the 11% increase in yield is still gratifying, but. Uh, it, I think it underestimates the effect we're getting. We had a 22% average reduction in total water use, 35% average reduction in irrigation, and the water use efficiency was 52% higher total, and 78% higher in terms of irrigation water. You get 68% more kilograms of rice produced per liter of water. Now that's a really important thing to consider in a water short world. Next one makes it even more interesting. This is research done at the Water Ranch Institute in India, where they took the same variety of rice, everything was controlled except the management practices, and they were looking at the ratio between water loss by transpiration compared to the carbon dioxide fixed into carbon hydrogen, or synth photosynthase. And they said for each one millimole of water loss by transpiration, SRI plants fixed 3.6 micromoles of CO2 while convincing one plants fix 1.6 micromoles, which shows is the SRI plant is twice as efficient in converting, you know, or converting sunlight into <coughs> photosynthate per unit of water transpiring. Again, I'd love to have this done by others, but I'm sure this was done carefully. I know that uh, the research is very well, so they call off and the polish the article off. The fact is that we're getting plants that are more efficient. The phenotype both physiology and morphology get altered by this. So this is something really important for uh, a water scarce world. Come back now, we get climate resilience, drought tolerance, resistant to lodging caused by wind and rain, less vulnerability to pests and diseases, more tolerance of cold temperatures, these plants uh, when uh, submit different kinds of stress. This is one of the first picture got from Sri Lanka, showing the same variety of rice, same irrigation system, same soils, but after the water stopped for three weeks, because the reservoir had dried up. And on the left you have a plant, plants grown conventionally, because the root systems are not adequately developed. When they have three weeks of water stress, they're struggling. Whereas the ones on the right, which started with small seedlings, widely spaced, you know, just limited water applications, getting a good root system, they can uh, tolerate this and get a decent uh, result. Uh, EMI, the National Water National Institute, did a study in 2003-2004 where they did 75 days of drought, severe drought, and they compared the SRI grown plants and conventional plants under similar conditions. 80% of the tillers form panicles in the SRI plants, only 70% in the conventionally grown ones. Uh, there were 10 times more plants per square meter 
in the pharma practice, and yet the panic was bearing tillers was 30% higher in the SRI fields. Uh, number of grains panic was higher. Harvesting yield was 33% higher. Uh, and the drought conditions of the SRI plants are transfer getting more food acidity into the grains. So you get a better result. That's a physiological difference. And this is done by any science. Yes? Go back to your earlier slide, you referenced uh, lodging. Oh, I'll come to that, yeah. What do you mean by that? Oh, that's when, when, the, when the plants are blown over by the wind or the rain and storm damage. This is from Sichuan, China. This is the first province in China to take them seriously and promoting it when they had only 1,133 hectares in the province. They've gone up to 300,000 in <clears throat> six years. What's interesting is the, the SRI advantage, yield advantage, was highest in the two drought years. They had drought in 2006, 2010. And so you can see, I mean, these are all respectable differences. You get the highest difference under conditions of water stress. Um, also, this is uh, uh, work on wheat by the Indian Ag Research Institute where they took SR ideas and applied them to wheat. And the innovation which I loved was they worked on the NGO to set up a research experiment, which had been doing SWI in Bihar State. And they brought a Bihar farmer in to actually manage the experiments. The scientists set the protocols, but the actual work with plants was done by a farmer who knew how to do this. And our suspicion had been that you just get this, you know, research station workers to do things they won't be properly careful for the plants and so forth. So we had a farmer plant. But in a normal year, the SWI methods, Y space, they, they did direct seeding rather than transplanting, but still Y spacing, some of the aeration and all that. 30% yield advantage over the scientists best managed practice on their own experiment station. This next year, they had high temperature <coughs> during the flowering and then heavy rains. Yields of wheat suffered across most of in North India that year, but the yield advantage of SWI over the standard recommended type was 46%. Because the, the loss in yields are like 12% versus 18 to 30% with their usual practice of crowding, you know, fertilizer, uh, and, and so forth. So there's a real benefit in the economic benefits of 35% high, a real benefit uh, from using the methods also with other crops, which we'll talk a bit more about. This is, here's, here's your logic. This is a picture from about hours north of Hanoi, uh, where the same variety of rice, on the left you see an SRI field, an SRI plant. <laughs> on the right is a conventionally grown field, of conventionally plant, lodged by the wind and the rain. And we see this timing. I've seen this in Pakistan. I've seen it in China. Uh, and so it's important. This is actually in the EFAD, a German aid agency publication, showing the difference in you know, resistance to storm damage, which is going to get more and more, I'm afraid. Um, so, can I ask yes? a question? That sure. Usually we think of, of the, in the Green Revolution um, mm -hmm. story, the lodging was due to the uh, tallness of the plants so when they bred them to be short. Yeah, they so, bred it to come but down, these right. look pretty tall. It's, it's not a height issue. It's not a height. The thing is that the, again, well, this, this year, this data from China again, they actually measured the diameter of the stalks, the breaking point of the stalks, and so the plants, you know, the, the plants expression gives you, you know, higher breaking resistance, higher bending moment, a longer or shorter internode length, which is a good feature, uh, more dry length for the heat unit, uh, more diameter. So the plants change and are able to resist the stresses of either wind or rain. Uh, this research was showing the difference between with zero fertilizer and with then 180 men. That's, that's a pretty high dose of uh, anything we're putting on. But there's significant difference between the SRI grown rice and the eventually grown rice in terms of these uh, physiological and morphological features. This is from Vietnam, where they did trials in eight provinces, side by side trials, farm practice, SRI practice. Look at the major diseases and pests, sheep, white, leaf, white, small leaf, over brown, pet hopper. And the spring season is about a 55% advantage, less you know, so pest and disease. Uh, in the rice that's SRI grown, 70% difference in, in the summer season. Uh, we see this kind of in lots of places. This is research from Kamenada, which helps you research hybrid rices and HYVs. 
looking at yellow stem bore and gall midge, and can you see the reductions in the plants just naturally once they've been given more space, better root growth, more organic soil, more aerobic soil conditions. And this, some is the most conclusive. This is that woman, remember that woman showing her two rice plants in Indonesia? This is her field on the right, an organically grown aromatic variety of a traditional rice. Uh, and on the left is her neighbors who have modern variety inputs. And the field, this village had hit first by a brown plant hopper attack, which is a terrible <coughs> pest of, of rice, and then by a tropical storm went over. Mm -hmm. And so her neighbor got almost nothing, and she got an eight ton yield from a traditional variety. But she's been doing organic farming for many, many years. Uh, I've never seen her field, but I'm sure it's really good, rich, uh, fertile soil. But here you can see side by side these two plants. <laughs> so, this tells the story itself. This is data on cold resistance at the uh, Andhra Pradesh Agriculture University. They're doing IPM trials, that's what I got, and they got a cold spell to the bottom here. They had uh, five days below 10 degrees uh, Celsius. And in that season, the normal Red method is 2.25, 3.47, that's good. But in the monsoon season, I had this cold spell, almost no crop because it, the cold spell came at a bad time for advanced growth. That's why I said that for 0.16. So this is a kind of resistance to stress, which I think is going to become more important. So also, there's a slow sense, it's a bonus in a way, that when you don't flood your patties, you reduce methane production, we know. The fear was that you may increase your nitrous oxide production since nitrous oxide is about 25 times more potent. A small increase in nitrous oxide will offset big gains in methane. But we've not found in the SRI that you have, sometimes it even doesn't, uh, doesn't increase at all, but in any case it does not offset the gains in methane reduction. So there's a 20 to 40 percent reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions from the global warming potential. But that's how I use some of the studies that I'm studying there. So for us, you know, it's not a main concern, but we now have discovered and learned that in fact you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from rice paddies by switching from SRI management to regular. This is from Taiwan National University in, in Korea, where uh, Dr. Choi was doing his own evaluation. So this study done by researchers here and there, and everywhere we try to keep up with the best we can. Uh, these ideas may extend to uh, crops, wheat, finger millet, sugar cane, teff, maize, and we had some evidence from India and Ethiopia and Jersey along with mustard, soybean, black gram, green gram, red gram, tomatoes, chilies, eggplant, sesame, turmeric, cumin, coriander, green leafy vegetables. So uh, these ideas of spacing, timing, soil management are, are proving that there's usually farmer adaptations uh, to be very beneficial. This is uh, a uh, field in Bihar, state of India. Same variety of wheat, same planting date. And you can see the difference in the phenology of the crop, how much further advanced the uh, one is on the left, which is SWI. This finger millet in Jharkhand, state of India. <coughs> this plant on the right here is a traditional variety with low practices, an improved variety with traditional practices. You see how much better genes can, can make the plant. <laughs> but if you take that improved variety with S FMI or SCI methods, you get a whole different expression of, of that potential. These are pictures they sent me showing a difference in, in the panicles, in, in the diameter, and look at the root system. Again. The same thing we see in the in SCI <coughs> for rice, you see also with finger millet uh, production. <coughs> This is Cuba on the right and India on the left using these ideas of sugarcane production. Sugarcane is usually 60, 70, 80 tons. They figure 150 ton yield in this Cuban uh, plant, you know, uh, growing of SSI, and that's, I don't know the yield for one on the left, but you just see the phenotype. It's just so magnificent. And this picture is of Ethiopia, where they started using these ideas about seven years ago. Then you have a direct seeded variety, which is very labor saving, not as good as the transplant. If you transplant, you get three to five, six, size, seven, ten yields instead of one. But if you use the sort of 
for mass production and labor saving, really nothing. You should get a 70% increase in yield and you know, no extra labor. But this is one where they've actually you know, transplanted and gotten just fantastic uh, response to this. Um, now there's quick data on improvements in grain quality, uh, looking at 30% um, uh, reduction in chalky kernels, 65% overall chalkiness, milk rice outturn, 16%, head rice being unbroken grain, 70 So these grains from the paddy field, when you take them in and mill them, they have less breakage and less chaff. So farmers get a bonus, uh, or consumers get a bonus. Farmers may not get paid for this. <laughs> In fact, I first learned about this in Sri Lanka where someone told me that the millers were now coming to SRI farmers fields before harvest and offering them 10% more per bushel. And that meant from the previous year they figured out they get more than 10% higher upturn. Yes. And so they were the farmers SRI patty. Uh, now we should have farmers be sure they get that 10% uh, or more for themselves. Um, this is uh, showing duration. This is from Nepal. Uh, how many farmers do we have here? Um, well, those 412 farmers, eight different varieties. This, this is the, how long the crop is supposed to take to mature. This is what the SRI was, average and range. You average about 16 days quicker harvest <coughs> with double yield, 6.3 versus 3.1, by using these methods. Uh, this is just a summary on things we've learned about advantages for women. Uh, one study in India showed 78% less time required for weeding when you have that weeder versus the hand weeding. Uh, and we, our Indian colleague had a very interesting methodology where she would have villagers draw a picture of women and then the women would describe where it hurts when they do the different operations and talk about trying to get some consensus on what the physical effect of this is. She's got a thesis which will be done for bargaining and fairly soon, uh, but she called it the Maricopa method uh, for getting this data from qualitative form into something you could actually quantify and, and, and report. Um, uh, this is again the truth. I think I'm okay now to just finish it off here. We find that nutrient dynamics are very different. Uh, and this is our first research done in Madagascar for Cornell uh, master's thesis by a really brilliant young Malagasy researcher. And he was looking at the uptake of nitrogen, but also the P and K, looking at the grain yield in response to the amount of nitrogen or test. The same, same uh, dynamic as all three mic micronutrients, but as you increase your uptake of N or P or K, you have plateauing up around four on these soils. SRI plants would go up maybe plateau around 12. And so what they were doing for the same, what was interesting is look at the difference between for any one level, you're getting more grain produced. And no one has followed this one up for a recent time. I really want this one to be done properly. So what is going on that for a unit of macronutrient taken up, you get a higher yield. And uh, I think what's happening is that as you stimulate the life in the soil, the microorganisms, you, and I'll show you next, we have more uptake of micronutrients from the soil. And I think when you have more micronutrient uptake, the plant is going to be able to utilize this macronutrient uptake better to have more of the enzymes from metabolism produced with the brawn and the zinc and all the micronutrients needed for that. So the plant becomes more efficient in using its macronutrients because of the micronutrients, because of the microorganisms. That's a sort of uh, theory. I wish I could say that and prove that, but that's what we're seeing. And anyway, th this, this dynamic, which Zoelli found in control trials, the N, P, and K, that the, the phenotype, conventionally grown, crowded, flooded, etc., you know, can increase with macro, yield with macronutrient uptake, but it increases much more if it's an SRI plant. So anyway, this is research published in the Journal of Plant Nutrition by scientists at Indian Agriculture Research Institute looking at the control of milk fertilizer, the NPK fertilizer, conventional SRI for iron, zinc, 
copper and manganese. And uh, they found that you had higher uptake in the brain of these micronutrients when you had SRI management or if you had, it depended how much the NPK fertilized at or no. They did an really <coughs> organic set of trials. I wish they had. Uh, they were looking at, at this. But this was part of the research, and they also then looked. Uh, uh, this is another research at Indian Ag Research Institute. Uh, look at SRI versus conventional tillage <coughs> in the grain and straw and nutrient content. So you see that the plant takes up and what the actually ends up in the grain, and you have significant improvements in. Uh, the SRI grown plants for all of these copper and manganese, iron, zinc, and sulfur. So they were very interested in that. And we have now some works, not published yet, uh, but I expect it will be from the Indian Institute of Water Management, looking at conventional with integrated nutrient management, including inorganics, conventional organic, SRI, INM with inorganics, SRI organic. And you see iron, zinc, copper, manganese differences. Um, the SRI organic is always more than the conventional with fertilizer. But in between, sometimes the significance is there. You know, manganese is not that much difference. Uh, but you see it at the, at the third one. And this is some uh, effects of the practices in nutrient management on microtrutin in the grains itself. Again, iron, zinc, copper, manganese. The SRI organic is significantly more than the uh, conventional with, uh, with fertilizer. So, again, a lot more research needs to be done on this, but we have some, I think, reliable initial results showing that by changing your management, you're going to be able to get more nutritious food. And, and I, I think it's not only for rice, but all we can talk about now is for rice. If you could increase the nutrient content of rice, one of the major foodstuffs, 20% of the world's calories come from rice, or from sort of human consumption of food. 20% of the calories comes from rice. If we can get these kinds of increases, these are like doublings almost of micronutrient value, this would have a huge impact on nutrition. So we say SRI adds higher nutritional quality to the many, along with the other benefits of what needs to be done. The link is that the practices, so microbiology, Micronutrient uptake to plant growth and health to micronutrient product in the food raising the food supply. If you want to understand how this works, you read David's and Anne's book. Uh, Mark, Mark and I read this, or we heard it on audio tape. We were going down to these Donna meetings in Tampa, Florida six weeks ago, and we just loved the book. It really accounts for these dynamics in the soil and also does make links to, to the human health. Um, I'll just call them this saying a few quick things. This was developed for poor, small, resource limited farmers in Madagascar, who's in respect to many countries. One of the raps against this from scientists, from rice research institutes, is, well, you can't do this on a large scale. You know, this is only good for small farmers. And it so happens we have a really helpful <coughs> colleague in Pakistan, a very, well, I would say sort of wealthy, agriculturalist, businessman, farmer, inventor, philanthropist, who have you know, brought in all kinds of heavy machinery to Pakistan from U.S., Britain, Italy, Poland for years and years. About six years ago, I said, you know, we're really ruining our soil in the Punjab with all the mechanization, all the water irrigation, all the chemical and fertilizers. Isn't there a better way? And he happened to find our website. And SRI, and also learned about conservation agriculture. He started reading about organic agriculture. And he's put together a, an approach which is highly mechanized, using its principles for large scale. Uh, he happens to have his own machinery workshop, so he can go out and tinker with the machinery design. He's rich, he can do it. Uh, but he, I mean, I'd want to, he's an incredibly dedicated, sincere person, um, very distinguished. He calls this paradoxical agriculture because it's more from less by combining SRI, CA, and organic agriculture. And this is his company, Padaver, transformative producer. You can check his website. He gets crop yields with 70% reduction of water and 70% reduction of labor. 
this is a test plot. He had a 44 acre test plot. And what he does, he has a machine that makes these raised beds, 45 inches across, nine inch furrows. It's like on a table top. And then his second machine, <coughs> and also he irrigates with furrow irrigation using siphon, so there's no energy cost of pumping. But this is the machine he designed where the laborers can sit, I won't say in great comfort, but you know, it's not sitting down. <laughs> yeah, you know, sitting down. And their job is to drop nine day seedlings into the holes the machine has punched as it goes down the things, punched. He did nine inch spacing, not quite being willing to try 10 inch. And the thing about he said, you were right, because in fact, the, the, the plants on the outside were still more productive than the ones on the inside. So his subsequent ones raised a bit. And this machine had precision application of a little bit of fertilizer, a little bit of compost. So instead of four tons of compost, we had to put in 400 kg, but precision application each of these holes. They dropped the seedling in. And the seedlings are growing on mats of soil and compost, so you roll up like a rug for transporting them. It's kind of like rice is a grass. It's really tougher than it looks. Uh, so they drop the seedling in, and then they have a Bowser, see this tank up there, and after they drop it in, the, the tank fills the hole up, and then it seeps into the soil. This is dry soil, and it's really dry in the pool. And when he has the whole field done, he floods the whole field one inch above the top of the buns, which he is precision laid out, and that seeps into the whole thing. That's the last flood irrigation he does. Thereafter, he does furrow irrigation using the siphons. And because you compact the, the furrows, the water chooses more lateral. You want some compaction. And so he does you know, his, his as-needed irrigation. And then he has a specially designed weeder. Mm -hmm. And no driver, no? <laughs> radio control. But he's had such precision planting that it can break up the soil very nicely between those rows. He does not do the cross, you know, I mean, you can't do it with that. But if you do good you know, break up the soil in one direction, you did. You got average heat of 12 tons per hectare. Now, Pakistan in the Punjab is about five. That's with 70% less water and 70% less labor. So he's, he's really having some, and he's, he's, he uses good for anyone. I mean, he, that we, well, we're talking about how do you get sort of machine stations where farmers can rent for a few hours. They can't afford it. This is expensive. But, but you don't need to have a lot of these and you can, you know, you can you know, do the field in a few hours. How many this, of those does he have right now? Right now? Yeah. Well, he has about 560 acres on his farm. And he's doing custom farming for others. Wow. But uh, he's, he's still, I won't say he's dabbling, but I mean, this is not... I mean, he, he can do it for commercial, and he is a commercial farmer, but he's still doing his experimentation. But this is wheat you see growing this way. Just look at the health of those plants. These are carrots, and you know, 80% of you know, grade A carrots. He gets a huge increase because of quality as well as that. But formerly, they used to sort of broadcast carrots, and then they go through and till. And so if you have ridges, the plants all sort of bloom on top of it, and then they crowd each other out. Whereas this way he's drilling 700,000 seeds per hectare and getting very high return. This is figures put together for an article we published in the International Journal of Ag Sustainability. And you know, as usual, wheat yields go from 3 to 5, maize from 9 to 11, sugar cane from 710, potatoes 30 to 42, though he says it goes up to 50 if you once you do it a couple seasons because the soil improves. Carrots, that's a big boost there. Cost of production going down 43, 28, 21, 32, 67 percent. And the net increases are huge. That is getting But you, this is so fantastic. A lot of people have a hard time wrapping their minds around it. But he's showing all these other crops beyond rice can be productive by this kind of uh, methodology. So I threw this picture in. I'm sorry Mark Fulford isn't here to watch this. In. This is Mark's farm in Maine where he's using these ideas with his cropping and he sent me these pictures of his carrot crop. This is actually two years ago. But you know, he gets his bed. Sorry. I want to adjust it to Mark 
next picture here. That's his bed. It was 38 square meters. He got 109.5 kilograms of grade 8 carrots. Yield was equivalent to 73 tons per hectare. And when you look, if you did a costing, it would be $170,000 per hectare income if you did the, if you do that with carrots. Wow. It's just a huge productivity he'd get from that. And you know, just look at those carrots he's taking off that. He did those radishes, beets, daikon, and other crops as well. He tried with wheat, as I mentioned, and moose, unfortunately, got it. Uh, but we're hoping that we can get something that he has started in, in the U.S. Uh, you've got a little start on this. Uh, we have farmers in New Jersey, Delaware, South Carolina, Louisiana, not yet California. California should be doing this because we've got to save water. But in California, there's places where you know, if you save water, you lose your rights to it. And so that's why it discourages farmers to you know, you know, a water, you know, a water saving system. So anyway. Uh, we have at least 20 minutes, and I will stay along with anyone who's interested. Uh, if I show you last week, this is my email, ntu1 at Cornella EDU, and that's our website. We have more than you could ever want to know on the website for you know, the 58 countries, for the 20 crops. Uh, we have a, a listing of publications and literature now, over a thousand journal articles and theses have been devoted to this. Still, this is below the horizon for most people. Most of you have not heard about this before. Uh, the mainstream media, to some of them, uh, have generally ignored this. New York Times had a very nice feature on this uh, nine years ago and they never followed up. The Economist three times has sort of tipped about the edge of it and not said anything about this. Uh, I don't think I should, should make too much of a political argument, but this goes against a lot of interests in current agriculture. You don't need new seeds. You can use them. Give good results, but you don't need them. The sooner we go against the better. Uh, and you know, you, you can use fertilizer, but you don't need it. And that's really fighting words for a lot of interest. So uh, we can still have ways to go, but I'm glad there's this much interest here that we can share uh, some of this and uh, questions. You go to the website, send me emails. You know if anybody's done this with lentils? Pardon? Lentils? Oh, in India, yes. No, all the grams. Green gram, black gram, red gram. I don't know. Black gram is the lentil one. Uh, Legumes do, do very nicely, but you have to adapt, of course, for the spacing, timing. But the principles are being applied. Uh, uh, if you send me an email, I'll send you an article on SCI, probably on the crops. And I can have to have some people in India who try to tell you more uh, details on that. Yes. Just a follow-up question mm -hmm. that, um, for the legumes we are using, were you transplanting those as well? The legumes, again, it depends. Uh, and usually we're, we're, we're doing direct seeding, two, two seeds per hill. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you've got time, you want to go through and row them to take the less good one out. But uh, you got to make sure, that if you're direct seeding, you got to make sure you've got germination. Yeah. And so that depends a lot on your germination rate. But, uh, most of them, they, the transplanting really is better for rice than direct seeding, though direct seeding saves you enough time to make it more economical. Yeah. So in Vietnam, for instance, now they've got a really nice machinery for direct seeding rice into the patties. And they don't quite match the transplant yield, but the payoff could be higher. These are all pragmatic questions. Yeah. And most questions you ask, I say, well, you've got to try it yeah. to see what works under those uh, conditions. But I, I know we have enough evidence on legumes. We're even getting experimentation on the like cumin and coriander and turmeric by Indian farmers, getting higher yields and much better returns because of cost <coughs> of stuff, like cutting the plant density, preparing the soil, composting it, uh, paying attention to the timing, uh, so you're getting the best uh, technology. Yes. Do you have, um, have certain compost that you recommend for different that you provide to these growers? Uh, we're saying any, any vegetative biomass decomposed is helpful. Uh, farmers have to sort of optimize beyond that. I, I wish we'd had the knowledge and the time and resources to try to get in. I'm sure there's some improvements we need to make to the margin, but why don't we say, you know, if I start with rice straw, 
and then you know, weed cutting, loppings, and so forth. The farmer got the highest yield I've ever seen, which I, I mentioned, I showed on the picture up here. What he's developed now is a composting system where it is 1,300 square meters, which is on the lake of a hectare. He puts on five tons of compost four times a year. That's rice, cabbage, potatoes, beans, rice, cabbage, potatoes, beans. So he goes through four seasons of <coughs> cropping. That's a rate of 160 tons per hectare. But he's a small farmer. So for him, he puts his effort into mobilizing biomass. And his, his compost starts a rice straw. He puts in some banana leaf for potassium. He puts in a, a flower and weed, which is like budlia. And he uses wildly for potassium for budlia. He uh, uses lucina, or portolaria, for his nitrogen. He puts in eucalyptus sawdust, eucalyptus leaves, a little commoner, a little pigment, or a little chicken manure. And he makes this the, about the best compost I've ever seen. And you know, he's now tripled his area. I mean, he's made enough money from us, so he's now about three times what he started with. Uh, but again, his strategy has been to use his labor to collect, and even Madagascar stuff does grow. I mean, some arid areas won't work, but we're going to have you know, rainfall and <coughs> growth you can harvest. He shows some loft stuff here and there. Uh, makes huge, huge compost inputs. And so we've said, you know, any, any kind, you know, and I was going to ask Elaine the question this morning, you know, she didn't ever mention manure in the compost, and I want to know what her thoughts were on that. We, we, we tell people, first of all, our farmers usually, are, and this is Madagascar, too poor to have cattle, don't have manure. If you can add some manure, we think it's a good idea. But you don't have to depend on manure. Don't say, I can't do compost because I don't have farming enough manure. You know, just any biomass already got those micronutrients that you need to get back into the soil. Uh, and, you know, that's micronutrients. We also find that phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, not even with inoculation, in soils that are aerobic and well spotted organic matter, you can really get high production with what look like huge phosphorus constraints. I mentioned in Madagascar, we have three to four parts per million available phosphorus. And who I found is my wife, I'm sorry, she's shouldn't have been reading. She found an article in Nature magazine in 2001, Phosphorus Solubilization, solubilization in Re-Weathered Soils, where British environmental scientists had done three years of trials where they looked at 29 locations in England and Wales, soils that are wetted and dried versus all wet or all dry. And in the wetted and dried soils, the available phosphorus were 185 to 1900 percent greater because of the biological activity. When soils were aerobic, these aerobic bacteria would then be acquiring inorganic or unavailable phosphorus or monosyl phosphates and stuff like that. And then when you flood it, they release that into the soil solution because they lies when they're in water, dry the soil, and the survivors and all the sun go back to work. And so you're wetting and drying of the soil as the effect of mining phosphorus from the unavailable portion brings into the available portion. And it's really, I never first thought about that in my house, but we find that you know, the soil, it's not just one thing, it's the soil, water, nutrient, plant management together with the microbial you know, response. And so these very poor soils can be very productive if you get that right combination price in all five of these elements you need for successful crop production. Huh? Yeah, the microbe you want for that purpose is called Pseudomonas fluorescence. What? The microbe you want is Pseudomonas fluorescence. Oh, Pseudomonas, yeah. And we, we often see that. Um, uh, and it responds very well to compost. Uh, there's some Indian studies we've seen on that. But <coughs> it's often the comp compost <coughs> organism rather than any one single one. I mean, the same organism may have different function in a different community of microorganisms. I mean, we can try to pin down this does that and this does that. At least from my reading, from what I'm seeing is that you know that we're talking all about communities and that they they sort of fulfill so many different functions depending on what else is there. And so the kind of neurobiotic research we do is sterile sterile study effect on one organism separately. I think gives us a lot of misleading uh, response. But we don't know how to fully evaluate these complex systems. Uh, 
but we do know that organic matter, oxygenation, those are the huge difference uh, in how those communities function. Yes, Dr. Um, I, I have two questions. Sure. Um, one, I haven't heard you mention anything about minerals. Um, and minerals? Minerals, okay. And two, um, there's a big push recently about um, intercropping mm -hmm. and in direct, mm -hmm. the opposite of what you're doing. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Uh, minerals, uh, I guess we're finding that if you do these other things, they don't seem to be a constraint. Um, but I don't want to speak that too, too long. Uh, uh, the question about, um, the second question was, intercropping. We encourage that as much as possible, partly because we're trying to converge with CA. Some of you may know Amir Qasim, who's my big colleague in Britain who works on conservation agriculture networks. And I know he's satisfied. And we have examples in both Pakistan and in China, where in fact you start you know, going to no-till, mulching, uh, rather than doing it. If you get really good biological activity in the soil, you don't need to do that soil disturbance with a mechanical weeder. So we said we like to move from mechanical soil disturbance to biological uh, soil aeration. I think that's where <coughs> we're going. This seems to take time to change, but uh, we, have, we have colleagues in, especially in Macha Pradesh, which is kind of India, who are doing a lot of intercropping, where they're doing two rows of this and one row of that, and two rows of this. In our sugarcane work, we do encourage legume and other intercropping in the sugarcane rows. Um, but those are traditionally spread apart. example from India did mustard and wheat together and it's just the wheat yield was quite as high with the mustard as the amount of crop but your mustard crop was productive enough that you you're like 14 percent higher net income by doing wheat and mustard together uh into all wheat or all mustard uh, I think we're going to we're, we're still starting this kind of, we don't have a good answer for that our colleagues Almost all of them really start understand the principles, which are basically agroecology. Uh, are very interested in experimenting, and we all say, don't just do this logically, uh, do it empirically. But we keep trying to pull out some logical mm -hmm. principles to explain and make sensible what we're seeing. But we see something that really they don't make sense, and I'm sure a lot of my former colleagues still just can't believe this. I mean, we want to get them to go into the field and see it. Look at it, and that's often a very hard thing. But the scientists often really want to do their on-station work, and not to see what farmers are doing. So thank goodness a lot of farmers don't wait to be advised of the way around. Yes, I don't have a question, more a comment. Please, I had Mark Fulford coming up to my farm, and he was talking about the Bay Area and how they were doing it. He was talking about the Bay Area and how they were you know, we planted into a bit of lettuce and green house mm -hmm. and pushed over it, you know, put basil in between the tomato plants. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did spray hay, so I got a mulcher. So, uh, so I didn't do a lot of tillage. Mm -hmm. And the only thing is the peer pressure is, is mm -hmm. crazy because people come in and say, you are wasting so much space, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, like you got 10, 12 foot spacing between mm -hmm. tomato plants. And they just look like these little human shoes that you put them in and they're just shaking a head like you don't know what you're doing. And they come back at the end of the season, those things are twelve feet tall, going over and back yeah. down, and you can't walk across the eyes. They're so thick. And you know, I don't prune them, I just tie the leaders on. So I mean it really works and you can really space things out for so I put Brussels sprouts, you know, four foot apart out in the garden. I know this person, when I try to garden, I have a hard time spacing my plants 
as wide as I know I should. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. <laughs> All that space you're wasting. And my wife was more rigorous than this. I don't mean you're pouting still. She <laughs> uh, yeah, but I just know it's really hard to have faith that that little tiny plant is going to give you that huge result. But if you tap that potential is there, you know, you'll, be, you'll be surprised. Again, I don't want to say it too strongly because the many times you're not surprised. <laughs> the nature still has its own, you know, non the air abilities. But all in all, we, see, we need these Teff plants. Teff is the wonderful grain of an old hat. But, you know, normally it gets brought to us. And they use 20 times more seeds than they should. And the plants are crowded and they all lodge in the first rainstorm. And then you have to pull them up and harvest them and they don't grow fully. Teff is an incredible plant. I mean, the grains would be like a waterfall. You saw that picture. Uh, when they're given spacing, for them to express that potential which they have. And tomatoes, they can be just incredible creatures. But they need to have good root. And, and you know, the fiber of <coughs> the soil, I mean, mustard, you know, which is normally this little tiny, tiny inner seed. Farmers in Indian now are, are they plant about 18 inches apart instead of broadcasting, single seedlings. But they make a hole about 10 inches down, you know, 10, 12 inches deep. And they break up that soil and put organic matter in it. So the roots can really get a running start. Yeah. And, go, and the plants are bigger than I am. You know, mm -hmm. That little tiny seed. One comment on tomato plants is that, you know, if my friends have a greenhouse and they plant the beers conventionally, and they just pull a stalk and, and the roots right out. And I was down there and I said, I can't do that line. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, mm -hmm. come yeah. And I said, I can't. They, they came out, you can't pull the tomato plant out of the ground and it's not compact, it's just got sort of, it's pretty tight. You gotta take a saw and cut them out. Roots, roots, roots. I tell farmers, don't grow plants, grow roots. If you grow roots, plants will take care of themselves and the life in the soil. You know, the more the better. Uh, you might possibly overdose the problem. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you mentioned Elliot's going to come see us already. So we yeah. Have conversations you mentioned group cooperation versus group mm -hmm. competition. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we plant in the greenhouse. We put uh, 12 rows of carrots on the 30 inch beds, mm -hmm. and they're two inches apart in the row. Mm -hmm. um, I think they cooperate mm -hmm. because what that allows us to do is get a consistent <coughs> sized. Carrot and mm -hmm. the market we sell to wants these things that are about five inches long. Mm -hmm. And sometimes spacing can be used for other purposes. Mm -hmm. I talked to a British grower, an older grower, and he said years ago, when British people had bigger families, he wanted cauliflower heads that were like this. But now, when he started his plants, he put two seeds in each uh, uh, so watch when they were starting with it. And the two plants would grow side by side and allow them to have heads that was the purple size for today's time. So it isn't always maximum. Sometimes there's a reason for spacing for other. Well, optimization is a better idea than maximization. It's a strategy. I do something similar with sunflowers, which I grow commercially among other flowers. And I, a lot of the varieties that I like for one reason or another are so thick stemmed, they're very unwieldy, uh, hard to deal with. And if I plant them uh, really more than closer than the recommended uh, spacing, they're perfect. Mm -hmm. well, I just train like everyone you know, so plants compete. And I think when, when you, met, this, you got me thinking about it, you talked about the cooperation and mm -hmm. competition. I think there is cooperation. Uh, we know from rice that you know, some of the elements we talked about with Father comes that spaces, you know, plants adapt yeah. to how their proximity to others. And why would they do that? I think it's because the evolutionary algorithm has been that plants in total do better when they accommodate each other. And so the, you know, the, we don't plan to us substandard stuff that reaches full potential, but that's just the one plant, not the species. 
And I think that the way in which plants have evolved is there are a few apparently, about nine percent, nine five percent of the plants have a very aggressive strategies, but most of them have the comedy one, and the goal is not to produce as much as possible. That's our goal. They want to survive to reproduction. And so their strategy, most of them will reproduce most likely if they accommodate each other and share those resources. That's why when you give you know, a lot of nutrients, uh, they won't take it out. So the plants are limited as how much they will take up because they know what's good for them and what's not. I even have what I call the potato foie gras strategy of agriculture, the stuff, the food down the goose's throat so it gets a big fat liver. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to force feed plants, and they didn't evolve for that kind of situation. They evolved to be able to scavenge and optimize and, and, and survive. And reach through to reproduction. I think we understand plants better with that kind of a, of a, of a perspective on that. Yes. Um, Regarding the spacing of the, mm -hmm. of the rice plants, um, am I correct in assuming that most of this work has been done in a more tropical climate? And mm -hmm. if so, has work been done with japonicas in a more temperate climate? We, we have both japonica and indica. We don't see much difference in terms of the principles. Uh, but you know, temperature, soil, viability all makes a difference. This picture, by the way, is from Bihar, this farmer, had a 24.2 ton yield, which was the world record, which of course scientists didn't want to accept, but it was done properly. These are the sheets they brought in from the field. We have to look at the panicles of those plants. They were, they were planted 25 by 25. So I say, the one farm I know in Madagascar was 50 by 50, and that almost as good a yield as four plants per square year instead of six times <coughs> Anyway, plant potential is something we really need, and those who are working with crop production, we really need to respect and to learn from. We have to follow my nature. Plants should be our teachers, our masters. Uh, what do they respond to best? And especially with climate change, we have a lot of adaptations. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough, but we have to keep looking at the plant and what it's going to tell us. I just had a, a, a breeder was telling me that japonicas are a little more nervous. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're designed to be growing in a shorter season. Mm -hmm. And so their vegetative period is going to be less, mm -hmm. be less potential for tillery, mm -hmm. more, it's less more anxious to, you know, to boot and set seed. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm wondering if japonicas are not quite as, if indicas have an advantage in the SRI system as opposed to japonicas. Well, again, our philosophy is not to have the best of the whole world, but in any one environment, what can do the best? And if you're in a northern environment, Japonic is still probably better than your hunger. So, we, and, and all this research of Katiyama started as understanding Philippines was with, with, with Japonic. Uh, so we say, you know, take, and also Blabberine in West Africa, we're using you know, uh, these methods with those indigenous varieties there. The principles are what's important, I think. Uh, the actual application, that takes each person's observation, intelligence, creativity to make the most of it. Uh, but the idea of the cooperate, the plants cooperate is a vision take. It's, you know, I think in our Darwinian, both Darwinian notions, it's all competition. And in fact, uh, there's a huge, a huge element in the cooperation of this. Well, thank you all. Uh, you have a North America, we are almost there.